I work for a Swedish university called Hyper Island. Um, we help people learn how to adapt to technological change. Um, in that spirit, um, Pete asked me, I think it was Thursday, if I'd mind giving a talk. Um, we didn't get anyone to fly across the pond from Kickstarter, so uh, here I am. Um, I backed about 400 board game projects on Kickstarter, so I'm a bit of a fan. Um, I've also, also worked on quite a big project, uh, so it was about three years ago. Um, I worked in hardware startups, um, and we launched a kids' computer kit on Kickstarter and um, hit 100k in about 18 hours, and then 500k in about four days, um, which was pretty crazy. It burnt me out in the end. Um, I won't go too much into that, but can talk about it afterwards. Um, in the end, we raised about 1.5 million, um, which was a bit insane, but also quite the experience. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think we did um, and how we got there and hopefully sort of inspire some ideas and we'll have a discussion at the end um, and then something else after that. Um, so often people ask me to talk to them about what we did um, and to give them advice on Kickstarter. Um, and what I often say kind of goes against the grain a little bit um, from what is generally accepted wisdom of get backers before, get backers from social, and get backers from PR. Um, and I often think, well, my, sort of what I felt that we did um, with our project is that we made something that people want rather than making people want something. Um, and as I said, often we're taught that uh, a good story is a, has a beginning, middle and end. And funnily enough, that sort of Mirrors, mirrors up quite nicely with, you know, you get backers before you launch, you get backers via social sharing, and you get backers, you know, via PR, which is like, you know, the big bang. Um, but actually, what we're often told is a good story, a good story, rather, is important to the audience, um, and it feels meaningful for that audience. So how do you, how do you get there? What does that even mean? How do you get to important for an audience? Um, and it's a bit corny, but, um, often you sort of have to go back to why, why it is that you're doing this thing. Um, so I'm making a cooperative camper van game at the moment, because I like to roll around in camper vans in years gone by. Um, and so that, you know, it's something important to me. Um, and I'm thinking at the moment about why am I doing this? Why am I making a game? Why do I want to make a board game? Um, and so going back to why um, is, is super important um, in your process. And actually what that helps you do is to come up with um, values, um, and these values sort of translate throughout the process. So with Cano, the first one, it was technology, it was computer kits for kids. Um, it was also to do with education. Um, the idea was to help people learn things, learn coding, etc. And the final one was to do with creativity. So you have sort of these four or five values um, that you come from when you think of the question why, um, and those translate to the rest of the project really. When you're, um, when you're thinking of a prototype, when you're making something, um, obviously it's coming from you. So if you view <coughs> your prototype, the experience that you're creating for others with these values that you are bringing, um, then that hof often helps translate that experience to, um, to, to the customers and to the people. So um, with Cano, we created a prototype we tried to imbue it with all the, uh, the values that we had as a group of people, um, and kids end up sort of thinking, we made this computer, we're like super children. Uh, so it was that, putting that experience, um, and imbuing that with the values that we sort of felt as we tried to make this thing. Um, and then sort of going forward, um, I think the really key thing that we did was cr creating a tagline that was really easily understandable and really spreadable, rather than thinking about it going viral. Kind of viral has the idea that the person who's receiving it doesn't have any agency in then sharing it. But the idea of it being shareable and sort of you know creating that with your community um, and imbuing it both with your own values and the values of the community you're creating it with, um, those are the kinds of things that you need to do in order to build something that people want. Um, so more practically, how did we sort of come up with the line? Computer anyone can make. Um, you take those values um, and you, know, you thesaurus the heck out of each of those words, um, and it's almost like a roulette machine, uh, a slot machine, um, and you think of loads of different phrases. So long as you're ticking those, though, each of those values, 
we then have the values that translate into the initial prototype <coughs> to the product itself and how it creates experiences for people, and then also eventually into the messaging. So coming up with a line that people will see on social media uh, when they're scrolling on their feeds, on um, and then they sort of see it and they understand it, um, and then they click through hopefully, um, and then thinking about that how you translate that to like the project page, say, um, thinking about how people actually uh, use content online. Uh, so this is like a heat map of someone reading a page on the internet, um, and no one reads every single line. So you've got to think, what do people, what do people want to read for scannability? Um, so in most of the projects I see on Kickstarter, I don't really watch the video. Um, I look for, the first thing I do is I look at the theme, so like the tagline, what is it? Um, probably then look at the components, how am I interacting with this theme? Um, and then, to, I guess, the reward. So it's all, all of that stuff is quite sort of conceptual and visual. Um, and building a project page in line with your values and thinking about how people are coming to the page, it then makes it much easier for them to go through the backing process. Um, so then taking those values and then actually practically translating them into like a big fucking long list of uh, people you're going to reach out to. So I don't know if there's all kinds of weird emails in here, but um, the, this was a list I made for our project a few years ago now. But, um, there's like a type. Uh, so our types were to do creativity, technology and um, education. So you, then you take the values that you create at the beginning and that go throughout the project and the, and the prototype and you translate them into who you're actually going to reach out to and talk to. Um, and so there's a direct line, direct thread. Um, and yeah, there are loads of, sort of ways to find anyone's email address. Um, anyone who is online has an email. Um, I didn't really sort of, this is a list that I just sort of send to my friends when I talk to them about doing Kickstarter. Um, and that process actually had um, co-founder of Apple back our project, which was quite cool, and that in itself became a story. Um, so finding <coughs> interesting people to then, that are sort of in line with the project and the, and the prototype and all of that kind of stuff, feeding those values through from beginning to end uh, was definitely our process. Um, and I think how we got to how we got to 12,000 backers <coughs> and uh, you know, another story that, that someone who was interesting and relevant and influential back, ended up backing the project. Um, so yeah, taking the values, just a quick sort of summary, taking the values that you start with the question, reflect on why you're doing it in the first place, uh, playtesting and prototyping with similarly valued people who then end up becoming your pre-launch backers uh, and not sort of thinking, I need pre-launch backers, how am I going to get them? It's almost the other way around. Um, imbuing your prototype, your, the experience that you're giving others with your value, with your audience values, um, and you discover that by talking to people, by playtesting with them, um, by prototyping, seeing which parts of the experience marry those values and which parts accentuate, accentuate them. Um, and then developing your messaging and layout in line with those values so that people can come to it and find the easiest route to, uh, to back your product. Um, and then finally, using those values to build like a big long list of press you want to reach out to, um, influential people that you want to, um, that you want to back the project. Um, so yeah, that was what I think is our process. Um, I don't mind if we do a Q&A now. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, but I'm also kind of interested in connecting you guys with each other. So if anyone has, if that resonated for anyone, or if anyone has any ways that they've built products and communities and launched them on Kickstarter, um, if they want to share, that might be interesting. I do have a quick question. Yes. Um, I that you, you, you indicated that uh, you, you, you tracked people down. Yes. Um, what sort of thing do you do to approach somebody like Steve Wozniak to take a look into I did skip doing? over that very quickly. Uh, so <laughs> the key thing is that um, we sent all of these people a really highly personalized 50 word email. Um, changed a few of the, the subjects, but they were basically the tagline. Um, so, you know, it was a computer thing I can make. Um, so it's relevant to that particular person. But then the layout of the email, um, this is what I often, this is in fact one of the key things that I say to people when I talk to them about it, is 
love this thing that you did. And everybody had opinions. Love that you made apple. It wasn't that. It wasn't that. But it was, uh, <laughs> it was like, uh, it was something to do with, um, he had, it was a quote that he had done about education, and raspberry pie and, and education. Um, it was to do with that. So it was a recent quote. So like, hunt down something, if it's someone super duper famous, hunt down something that they've said recently and you know, show that you love them. Um, and then, you know, we're doing this, it's related. Um, and then, no, please share on Facebook, please share on Twitter. We'd love your thoughts. Because then that gives them the space to do what they want with it. Because they might be an investor, they might be someone who has lots of connections, you don't really know what they want to do with it. They might just want to give feedback. Um, so, yeah, those three things, really. It's, it's, you know, love that thing that you did. We're doing this. It's connected. We'd love your thoughts. Um, and he didn't email us back, but he did back. So that was good enough for us <laughs> <laughs> to go and talk to, uh, to the press about the fact that Poison Hat did back this thing that we were making. You mentioned that you didn't, um, when you were looking at um, Kickstarters, yeah. Um, that you looked at um, theme components and rewards. Is that just rewards <coughs> level you look at, or um, no, visually? Visually, I look at what I, I suppose components. That's just me personally. Like, I don't know. You know I, was, I was intrigued by your use of the word rewards about what what you actually meant by that. Um, I suppose just what you get. So I think when I say components, I think more. I think it's more of a conceptual thing, less like, are they good, and yeah. more like, so if is this. I guess the thought process is, is this theme interesting to me and my partner? How do I then interface with this theme? What experience is it going to give me? Right. And then, more physically, how does that translate into what I actually get? So it's a personal thing. About what yeah, doing. it's a personal okay. thing. Um, I mean, I don't think that's why I love Kickstarter so much. Um, I was talking to someone the other day who did their uh, MA on uh, crowdfunding, and they found they did loads of primary research and basically found that the main reason, and I sort of anticipate him saying this, but the main reason that people or super backers back loads of projects is because they want the thing to exist. Yeah, mm. um, yeah and I, I feel that as well. Like I often back things that I don't necessarily want to own, mm. but want to exist in the world and yeah. um, yeah, be there. Um, yeah, that's, that's good password. Yes. You said um, you want to build up your pre-launch backers. Yes. Are they they're people that you are kind of knowing and hoping and expecting will back once you launch? Yeah, so, so the I think not not the people you're kind of taking money off before you uh, no, 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 You're basically you're looking for those guys on day one. Yeah. Um, and so what often the often sort of advice is that you should definitely get these guys and that is you know that that more than anything else is like how you run a successful campaign and I think that I think that advice feels a little bit to me like have a good beginning for your story <coughs> what does that really mean um, and I think the way that you do that is by developing your product with your audience um, and the reason I think of story is because so when Someone said to me, uh, in, in fact, uh, so a friend of mine is releasing a, um, a mobile card game that uses a heart rate sensor to monitor your, monitor your heart rate and how well you do in the game. Um, and his C I was giving some advice to them, and his CEO basically said, you're, you're against the typical advice, you think it's about creating a good project rather than find the back is here, find the back is here, and find the back is there. I think the problem with uh, you know, find the backers here, have a good beginning, and middle, and end, is that it doesn't really tell you how to do that. But if you think that um, the original, like the oral tradition of stories was, you know, the Iliad and Homer, and, and it was less writing it, it was more telling it to a group of people, and he would probably see the mood of the group, and see, you know, the bit where Achilles' heel got struck, that was an exciting part, so that's, you know, let's turn that into... 20 stanzas or whatever, let's make that part really in depth. Um, and that, became, that obviously became an important part. So I think what I think is interesting is how you develop, if you develop your product with your audience um, and take the people who have play tested it and prototyped it and sort of bring them with you to the point that you launch, hope, hopefully those guys, and obviously you can nudge them, but those guys should be your 
day one backers. It's not that day one backers aren't important, but I think the narrative of how you get them is often, you have to find these guys and it's not really sort of directed that you should probably, you should build them into the process along the way. And does that answer your question? Yes. Do you think that Kickstarter is still the best way of publishing, uh, successfully publishing an indie book? And if so, how long do you think it's still going to be the best way for? Um, that question was interesting because still implies that it, you know, it has been for ages. And I think it's still, like, for lots of people, it's, it hasn't peaked yet. And mm -hmm. I think that this year was something like six times the amount, of board games made six times the amount that video games made. Um, I think what's interesting about Kickstarter is that they are very philosophically strict about what they do. Um, so I've known, I've got a friend there who's their head of education who I've, I've previously worked in advertising and would try and get her to come to events and um, no, no, no. And like, they're very, I think, what, and you know, Kickstarter is not a store and all that kind of stuff. I think, so philosophically, they are, they're not going to, sell the company, it's not going to change direction in that sense. I think the pressure sort of comes when there are massive other campaigns mm. that take a lot of the audience. Um, and I, to be honest, I disagree that that, I think ultimately what that does is bring more people in. Um, if you get larger campaigns, often larger, larger campaigns have people that, that it's their first time backing, and then they discover that there are lots of other things and then they subscribe to KickTrack and mm. see mm. all the, the projects and then they, you know, they, they get more into a rhythm. It just, I think uh, you know, it rises the tide um, in general. Um, and I think, as I said, said at the beginning, making <coughs> shit people want rather than making people want shit is, like, that's, for me, that's the, yeah, that is the difference between Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Mm. Um, having been solicited by both when uh, working in tech and hardware, uh, Indiegogo very much, we can get you on the front page, we can do this for you, we can put you in the letters, um, but all that doesn't matter if you don't create a good project. Um, and my experiences of Kickstarter have been that, what, you know, what do we, what is it about your project that makes it what people want? And they try and when I've worked with them personally, they try to bring that out. I think, like as I said, thinking about why you're making this thing in the beginning helps translate that into your messaging and your layout, and um, and even so, yeah. This this friend of mine, Simon, who's working on this um, phone game uh, that sort of monitors your heart rate, his values or the things, the audiences that he's working with, they're to do with health, they're to do with technology, um, and so they, the layout of the page even becomes, you know, you have a section on health, you have a section on gaming, and you have a section on technology. So that, you know, those values at the beginning very much directly translate into your messaging. Mm. Um, and, so, and I find that, you know, if I'm, if I'm personally, if I'm interested in, if I've got a kid who um, loves games, but I think could, you know, be a little less anxious and, you know, that, that game would be awesome for them, then I'm probably more interested in the health part. I'm not going to read you know, the whole thing, but I'm going to zoom into that part. And if that part is there for me to, to pick and choose, then, um, yeah, it's more interesting than, than it you know, not being there. And so that direct translation of those values is... is so, so, I mean, a lot of what you say it seems to turn back to values again. Yeah. The fact that Kickstarter allow you to put your values for front and foremost yes. as, a, as a publisher. Yeah. So as independent publishers and board gamers here, um, yeah. That again is our opportunity. You see, at the for the foreseeable future. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I don't. Mm. Anything more to add to that. I don't think that they in any way want to. So of course they make a bit of money. So they, you know, they like having big projects. Mm. But by the same token, they they want more projects. So I emailed um, my friend Stephanie, and she got it. Luke, the head of games, got in, got in back in touch with me and said I can't make it across the pond, but. This is awesome that you're doing this UK creators event and keep it going. So, you know, there was a bit of encouragement that we should continue to do this stuff. Um, so, and I think, as I say, their, their, their values are very much that they aren't a shop and that they are, you know, they're not going to sell, you know, they've had investors, but they're very much on a path that isn't, they're not going to sell their company. Um, 
and so they, they themselves are you know very much attached to that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, thank you. Cool. Okay. I don't know what the time limit is on this, but um, are we, are we, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Not now. Um, so the the thing you described about the, these values and making having a product with values that uh, people are interested yeah. uh, that seems to be uh, most appropriate or useful if you have like an, a product that is in itself like a new thing, a very original thing, like a <coughs> DIY computer. Yeah. I don't know about any DIY computer. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I could well imagine people seeing that and saying I want this thing to exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas within board games it seems that like, there's the product itself is already very well known. There's tons mm -hmm. of other board games, yep. and, and it, it, they're all the basically things that you use at the evening at a table yep. with your friends. And so it, it seems like we, we sort of can't like, put the origin originality on that surface level, but have to, I don't know, put it in uh, just in the theme or in the game mm -hmm. I... it, itself. And it seems a lot sort of harder to stand out with that. Or, or get any, I really want this, this to exist yes. type of backers. So, I think what you do, what, when you make a game, you're creating an experience, so when you play a game, you're experiencing something. Um, and the values that go with that experience are important. Um, whether it's going to make you, a, whether it's a game, an experience that's going to make you feel this way or that way. Those things are important. So when you look at, uh, so making, starting to make a game myself, starting to think about um, how I want this game to make people feel, um, I've looked at various, so my favourite board game Kickstarter publishing websites, and they all have this phrase that, you know, we make games that are this, this, mm -hmm. and this. And those are their values. Yeah. Those are the, the things that, that translate from backwards from, you know, they are innovative, they are whatever it is, back into the people that are making them. And it's, there's a direct, I think, correlation between the games that they make. So for me, I'm an, I'm an adventurous person, I love going, I you know, bought camper vans and went on van convoys in my youth, okay. and um, I think whatever games I make will end up having that go through them. Um, so I think whatever, I think there is a way to make it happen. Um, Staying on, hear the questions. Don't you? Um, I think there is a, a way to make it happen. There are obviously lots and lots of games out there. I think it's it's both making sure that the prototype and the product are imbued <coughs> with that, and that they create that experience for people. But also, as I say, sort of putting it in the messaging, um, so in the layout. So I know Pete's game, Statecraft. You know the political element. Yeah was really important for it. Um, and so he sent it out to loads of sixth form and you know, he'll tell you that he got loads of a surprising amount of responses back. Um, and there's, so there, I think there's an element of you know, what he probably wanted to do with that game and how he makes games um, coming through that um, and translating into eventually the messaging and who he spoke to and you know the Somewhere in the middle is the experience that you want to create for people. So I think there is a, a way to do it. Um, it's just a, thinking a little bit about how you translate each segment into eventually your messaging and who you're going to talk to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you, you might have a, um, a game. It, it seems like it's much harder to stand out with a game that's sort of more of the same, stuffing spices into a boat in, yeah. doing in Italy, uh, sort, sort of. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's, even though it's sort of the gameplay itself in there might be really good, but it's, mm. it's really hard to stand out yeah. with the product. But I think, like I think that, it, it might be good, but the product is hard to. Yeah, I think that sell. might be the same for Market. all yeah. kinds of, all of the different categories of Kickstarter, yeah, so whether it's a, yeah. a comic book or a, you know, like the new iPhone stand. Yes. That's going to be, you know, it's going to be the, the Euro manufacturing spices of the product design category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I think it's just about finding a way to translate it, and at least that's how I feel. Yeah. And um, why did you pick 50 words when you were emailing for? Um, just because we thought they were super time poor, um, and they weren't going to, if they were reams and reams of paragraphs, they're going to, even if they open it, 
if you've got their attention enough in the target, in the subject, to open it, and then they see that, they're just going to go, oh, I don't want to do that. Does the 50 words count the subject and their name? No. <laughs> they don't have to take it as, as exactly 50, but it was just a ballpark. Like, it's more how it looks. It's you know, an opening line, two sentences, and then would love your thoughts. It's just short, sharp, so that even if they open it and they, you know, they're curious, and they do open it, and it's like, oh, this isn't going to take much of my time, and then they actually read it, and then because you've built in the relevance through the values, there's more of a chance, you give yourself more of a chance to, to yeah. you know, have them actually click through, and then you know, if your page is sort of also embodies that, then you give yourself more of a chance. It's like, it's like doing a, a, a job. When you, when you fill in the application form for a job, you don't actually tell them everything. What you're doing is you're telling them sweetness that will want them to, to search out for more from you. So 50 words is a sweetener, and that's all it is. You don't want it, you want them to then search for you, and and and, it, and it's with it within everything. Everything's got to lead on to the to the next sweetener yeah. for them to search like for it. It's like a filter. It is, yeah, yeah. You 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 spread it, spread it wide, and they'll come. They'll, they'll, they'll filter back down towards you. Mm. You you've got to let them do some work. <laughs> not too much work. Not too much work. <laughs> but, you've got, but you've got to give them the, the lead. <laughs> and they will follow that lead. Yeah. 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 How much of a relationship would you say there is to, on Kickstarter between it, the very the, the single image you get when everything's tiled and the backing or at least the number of hits the views it's getting? Uh, def definitely. So, yeah, I think there's definitely a link. Um, Speaking with a friend with the mobile game, like we were talking about like what he called hero shots of his product, um, and some of them were good, and he thought that some of them were bad. But it definitely, I think it definitely impacts it. Um, whether it's the art or the, the game itself, um, I guess choose which you know which you think, and you can test them as well. Um, you know, the you know, Facebook ads can do you know, put an image and. You run a couple of them and you A/B test them and see which one gets the most clicks. Mm. Um, I mean, that's just like you spend like twenty-five quid and um, test a few different pictures and see see which one gets the most clicks. And then and then you've got like, even a, a few email signups and and some knowledge as well. Um, so, yeah. I have a question about um, adapting stuff as you go along. So. One of the selling points of a Kickstarter campaign seems to be that you can get feedback from the people you're actually marketing yeah. this to, and they feel part of the creative process. Yes. But I think there's a time limit on how long Kickstarter can go on for, mm. and even if there wasn't, you wouldn't want it to drag on for ages. Yeah. Do you, is, a, is a campaign really long enough for you to genuinely get feedback and incorporate it, if, even if you're only sort of going to use it later on after the campaign's finished? Without it really destabilizing and messing up your idea. Yeah, I think um, time is very strange in a Kickstarter campaign. It can feel very fast and very slow at the same time. Um, so my, I mean, it sort of obviously differs in the level you know that we were at. Um, but so we got like loads of money really quickly. It was really fast at the beginning, and then took a, like it really plateaued. Um, and we were having and probably partly to do with the burnout thing that I was speaking about earlier, but we were having internal debates and discussions about what the net, you know, we'd funded really quickly, what the fuck do we do next? Um, and there was really route discussions about um, the stretch goals, basically, mm -hmm. and listening to the audience and um, what should we do next. In the end, we, we did things that were pretty crap. Um, we did things that the audience did, we did things that we'd already planned and that the audience didn't really want. And I, and we waited ages before actually telling them. And I think that's why that plateau happened. So um, I didn't really go into stretch goals, but um, having a bit of a plan, uh, you know, this is the way that it could go if we, if we, you know, we think we're going to make our money, uh, if, we, if we think we're going to get funded with like five days to go, if it's going to be close, or you know, in the last 24 hours, this is the plan. Uh, this is the plan if we fund an immediate amount, amount of time, and this is the plan if we really go for it. Um, and I think you will 
get a few of those ideas. If you've play tested and, and done your prototyping well, you will have a few of those ideas already. Um, so thinking about what they could be and sort of taking the feedback and that kind of stuff. And um, a lot of the time you will see the things that people have, it will come up, <coughs> patterns appear again and again and again. Um, and the things that people will say on the page will often be things that have come up in, in prototyping and playtesting and those kinds of things. So it's just about having a bit of a plan as to before you launch and maybe speaking to manufacturers about you know, what would this be, what would that be. So kind of be willing to listen to what you have to say, but not necessarily plan on doing what yes. you say. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to you don't want to commit to anything, but you do want to have a bit of a plan. We didn't have a plan and it went to top. <laughs> Someone's obviously backlog if there isn't a picture. What are some of the pitfalls and pet peeves you have with projects? Um, my own pet peeve with when I talk to people and help them out is then when they send a, a mass email with loads of paragraphs and say and says at the end, please share on all your social networks. And I've specifically told them not to do that. Um, <laughs> It has to be much more personalised and much more succinct and um, has to also allow space for me to impose my own meaning on you know, what do I want to do with it. If, if it's something interesting that I know a friend of mine will like, then I just want to share it with them and hope that they back. If, you know, if I really want to back it, then I'll back it. Um, pet peeves otherwise, I don't think I have any, apart from that, nothing... Um, communication, probably. Um, I know it's hard because so with with our project we would because we have audiences everywhere you know you end up staying up quite late and getting lack of sleep and all that kind of stuff, um, but communication is probably important um, and no one wants to send a message and not knowing when the when the possibilities of them getting that message back um, even so just being open and upfront with your backers saying. You know, this is the time zone we're in, these are the sort of fun we might be able to answer questions. This time we're sleeping. Um, and just sort of being, I think just being open and up front. Um, I, yeah, now that I think about it, probably the, the communication thing, like if I'm writing a message and I don't get anything back, is probably going to annoy me. Yeah, so in that case, to stop being a victim of your own success, if you get the idea, well, this is really going big, how, is it worth uh, independent publishers or developers like people in this room um, looking to have somebody actually help them with marketing and plan for that either before or after they get a search? Uh, because like you say, if, if you then get to the place where you can't actually handle the amount of communication traffic you've got, yeah. uh, you can shoot yourself in the foot pretty badly. Uh, because a lot of us would probably be quite um, tentative yeah. about either paying someone yeah, yeah, yeah. or working with you know, a, a management. Yes. Uh, so the first thing I would say is that that if you do need to get someone, it doesn't need to be someone that you, you know, a hired specialist. Mm -hmm. uh, when we brought people on board, they were people that we knew from university mm -hmm. and that you know, could just go through the messages and be polite. That's like the key thing. <laughs> um, I wouldn't necessarily, yeah, I think that's probably my, my biggest thing about it. Um, just like friends who can be polite and answer a few messages. It doesn't need to be any kind of massive um, agency or contractor or, or anyone like that. Um, as long as they're polite and you have, and you be open with your backers and say, um, you know, we're getting a lot of messages. Which, um, so we did that on the fly. We, um, like I said, we didn't expect what, where we went and we didn't, we didn't communicate that we, that it was getting too big and that we were bringing people in. Um, so I think, yeah, just being open and upfront and listening to what they're saying and um, just, yeah, like, yeah, being open and upfront yeah. with them. Because yeah, they, we're all people um, and we all need sleep and rest and... Uh, I think it just feels like it's kind of that temptation if you, if you did see something really working and think, well, you wanted, you might be tempted to back it up with, with somebody who was paid, who was yeah. a comms, an expert. But then again, you know, if, if like the same, just going back to the fact that it's politeness yeah. and an acknowledgement is yes. more important than having something which... Yeah, I think, so one of the key things is probably write an internal FAQ, what, what, 
just copy and paste what are the questions that are coming through often. And then if you do get someone who, you know, who can help you out, have a basic set, like a, just a Google Doc of standard answers. Um, and then that will speed up their time as well. Um, yeah. We've probably got time for one more question. Uh, you mentioned in your in your uh, speech that you most often don't watch or don't like uh, videos. Uh, and you uh, like yeah. See, yeah. And you like to see the uh, the philosophy. So yeah. It's very that is me. <laughs> um, I can speak to that. Yes. Uh, it was it just. Was uh, it, it, uh, yeah. Uh, the question was: Is that because you specifically just like to see the philosophy through, or is there something about the videos that puts you off? Uh, it's probably just a, a, like an impatience thing. Um, <laughs> I look at them, if I really like the project, and so what often will happen if I back it and I'm really enthused by it, I will keep going back to the page and keep going back to the page, and then eventually what often happens, I notice myself doing this, I think, oh yeah, I haven't watched the video yet, I've watched the video. Um, uh, no, it hasn't, um, I don't think. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, so I've backed like 400 projects, and 300 of them are board games, um, so yeah, it's, nothing's likely to put me off. But, um, the video, it seems a bit more, like it, it puts more of a feel to it, but I think I, me personally, having been, seen a lot of them, I often get the feel from the places that I go to. Okay. Do you want to go into me? Um, probably going to up to the yeah. second for the next session. Cool. Uh, so we were going to, I think we'll come back to it later, but we're going to do uh, a bit of an idea, post it everywhere, rapid idea generation workshop. Um, we have many more questions than I thought, so we're going to go into that later. Um, just be ready to put those posters and walls and stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.